local groups as well. Uh, the box on the left has some instructions, um, but if you need more time to look at the instructions, there's a wonderful at, um, article on the Atlas website and that link is below. Um, I'm sure you can just use the search function on the website to find it. And our code is there um, and also in the article. So uh, today's agenda, um, we're going to talk a little bit first just about why we include or sometimes um, choose not to include technology in our instruction. Uh, then the fabulous Pam Dane is going to share with us how she is incorporating the new North Star Digital Literacy curriculum in her multi-level ESL classroom. And then I will um, talk about how my program is using uh, Google Apps and also some other options for um, formative assessment. And finally, we will have um, an idea swap and discussion because I know that there are so many um, people in the audience with fabulous ideas and we want to hear your ideas as well. So teaching with technology. Um, I just think it's really important to acknowledge that a lot of people may have some negative feelings about technology <laughs> and I think that's perfectly reasonable and valid. Um, we've all had technology related challenges or horror stories um, so go ahead and share a few um, because I, I just think it's really important to acknowledge there there are legitimate reasons that sometimes we don't use technology in our classrooms. Um, Something that has frustrated me in the past was when I worked at a school um, using Dropbox and I was co-teaching and I would put in so much work updating a presentation on my workstation and then I would go to the classroom where I was co-teaching and it hadn't synced properly with the other teacher's computer so all my work was for naught. What are some other issues people have had with technology? Yes, the internet not working, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Technical issues, limited access and corrections, definitely. Yeah, students just not really having this foundational skills to engage with the technology. Yeah, students might not have internet access at home. Um, Melissa's talking about having outdated technology. I'm sure that's a pretty common issue. <laughs> yeah, there's so much, um, thank you, Bill, so much content out there on the internet for K-12, but not necessarily um, things that are relevant or appropriate for adult learners. Yep, again, in corrections, um, it's, you just don't have access. <laughs> yeah, and Mariah says clunky, outdated platforms, for sure. So thank you um, for sharing. Um, I think another reason technology can be frustrating is sometimes teachers feel pressured to just use technology for the sake of using technology. Um, our school just bought all this fancy new equipment and you need to figure out a way to use it, go. And we're not really given the time or the support to use it in a way that is actually enhancing um, what we're trying to teach. It's just one more thing to deal with. Um, so I'd like to, um, focus on this webinar in not teaching that way, <laughs> um, using technology in really um, intentional ways that support all of the other things that we are already doing. Um, we know technology integration ultimately, if we're doing it well, is going to be worth the effort. Um, we know that digital literacy is a third of our state content standards that we need to be teaching. 
Um, obviously, you know, you're all on a webinar right now, so we have to use technology in all sorts of professional settings, um, higher education. And I think it's important to just take a second to think that even um, jobs that have traditionally been thought of as entry level or low skill um, now pretty much all require a pretty high level of digital literacy. I mean, this is a picture of a forklift um, that has a built-in touchscreen little computer thing. Um, so just to drive a forklift, you gotta be able to deal with this touchscreen. Um, I saw this article recently in the New York Times about um, this person works in retail, but her job requires seven apps on various devices. Um, and of course, we know that almost all job applications are online um, and, you know, simply completing an application can require a very high level of digital literacy. Um, and then if you're fortunate enough to be hired for the job, it's really likely that you're going to be doing your schedule and or your time card in some sort of electronic environment. Um, so we wanna give our learners um, access to all of those um, employment and educational opportunities and then just all the ways that we use technology in our everyday lives. Um, Megan Hines from the Hennepin County Adult Correctional Facility was supposed to join us today as one of our presenters. Um, unfortunately, she is really sick with influenza. So um, I really wanted to have a voice from corrections because I know it's a particularly challenging environment um, with this topic. Um, but she is willing to share um, her expertise with us. So watch for an update from the One Room Schoolhouse group on Schoology, and we will get you um, her materials uh, soon. I'm going to turn it over to Pam now, um, and she'll be talking about how she's been using the new North Star Digital Literacy Curriculum. Okay, I'm on, am I unmuted now? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Thanks, Pam. Great, okay. So um, basically I teach at three sites for West Adult Basic Ed, and I have helped a few students over the years get uh, some certificates through the North Star Assessment Program, but I've never taught a whole class the the um, all of the skills and vocabulary that they need to do so. Um, let's move to the next slide, or can I move it? Okay, thank you. Um, so basically, I I have a two and a half hour class. Uh, it's twice a week. It's multi level, but I've got to focus on everything else, just like everybody else does. Um, and uh, most of my students have uh, an online program through my class. Uh, a lot of them can be used on tablets or smartphones. Um, but nevertheless, even the students who have used online programs on the computers, they still don't know the vocabulary uh, for the North Star standards. Um, they might know it in their language, but they don't know it in English. And I've always embedded lessons into my less, uh, in, into my daily classes uh, using digital devices. Um, like reading skills for today's adult, Google searches, we do that all the time, uh, writing stories and sharing them with me through Google Drive or using news for you, sending me emails and, and different things. But again, I haven't ever tried to teach a whole class the skills of vocabulary that they would need to pass the North Star Basic Computer Skills Assessment. Um, and especially in this really uh, diverse class. Um, next slide, please. So again, my class is only two and a half hours long, and I thought, okay, how much time can I allot for this every day? So I decided that I'd try for 15 to 20 minutes. And I was thinking last early last summer, I, I didn't know if it was gonna be possible. Um, and I only did this in one of my classes, at one of my sites, I should say, at the St. Michael Albertville 
site. Um, that class has about 16 students, uh, levels from very beginning through advanced English. Um, some students have used computers, uh, a lot have not. Um, and my class routine is that we start with a class mingle or activity for the first 15 minutes. Uh, then we do about an hour in leveled groups. Uh, we take a short break. And I decided to use 15 to 20 minutes after our break uh, to get the whole group back together to go over uh, the lessons for the North Star. Most of the time, um, I was able to keep it within the 15 to 20 minutes. But there were a few times where a few minor challenges with things not working quite right or people not quite getting it. And so we took like more like 30, 35 minutes. And then after we were done with the lessons each day, then they'd go back to their leveled groups for the remaining of the class period. My goal was to have everyone in the class uh, take the assessment by the end of the class, uh, the school year, and, and pass, hopefully. Uh, but I really wasn't sure if it was doable. Next slide, please. Um, we have, I'm really lucky, we have lots of support from St. Michael Albertville and from West ABE, and so we have plenty of devices in our classroom. We have seven laptops, eight Chromebooks, 12 iPads, uh, smart TV, um, and most of the students have smartphones. So we had lots of uh, devices that we could use alone or share with partners and uh, to practice the lessons on so they'd all get hands-on experience. Some of the students again had hands-on experience but didn't know the vocabulary but then the other students needed the hands-on they hadn't done it before and they also needed the vocabulary. Um, next slide please. So uh, what I did to get a little buy-in was I, I um, um, whoops, excuse me. Um, I told my students we were studying to take a test uh, that would test their computer skills. And then when they passed, they'd get a certificate with their name on it. Um, and I told them that they could put that in a portfolio for job interviews. So they were pretty excited and, and um, they all were interested in doing this. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, when I started this, the North Star curriculum hadn't been released yet. And so I went through the assessment. I wrote down everything I thought that uh, they would need to know, all of the vocabulary that I was pretty sure they didn't know. Um, and I ended up with like 33 topics. Uh, I broke it down so that each mini lesson would fit into like 15 to 20 minutes. But you don't have to do this because the curriculum is out there now. And uh, it's fantastic. So you don't have to go through that whole process that I did. Next slide, please. Um, a major concern of mine when I was starting this was whether or not the more digitally literate students would be bored with the lessons and the pace that we were going to have to go. Um, but I found that all of the students, even the ones who were fairly proficient with computers, needed the English vocabulary, and none of them were bored with the lessons. And if they did figure out something quickly and were proficient at it, they were quite willing to help other students. So that was a nice bonus, too. Um, next slide, please. One thing I wanted to make sure I had was a place for them to take notes and to make sure that they knew exactly what we were doing the whole time. So they had a record of exactly what they had learned. Um, so I created a worksheet, if you will, in Google Docs and um, so that they could write down the vocabulary for each class period and any notes that they wanted to write down. Um, an added bonus that I hadn't foreseen was that when they're absent, they will track down another student, um, sometimes me, about what they've missed because they all want to make sure that they have everything in there. 
So when I did this on Google Drive, I used, um, I made three different copies of this. Uh, one blank one that I added to each lesson for the St. Michael Albertville class. One master copy for me with all of the vocab and lessons in what I wanted them to learn. And then a blank one. Okay, uh, next slide please. So again, although I started early last summer by determining what I needed to do for this, um, right thereafter, North Star came out with a curriculum for the basic uh, computer skills assessment. And I didn't have to create everything, and you don't either. As you can see here, this is a screenshot of the uh, uh, all of the lessons for the basic computer skills, and it's so well laid out. It is so helpful. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here's the uh, scope and sequence. So uh, you can see that everything is here. Um, the skills they need to practice, the unit-specific vocabulary, the standards, and the lesson outline. Of course, the hard part is trying to figure out a way you're going to do it in the classroom. Next slide, please. Um, one mini lesson that I created was to give them practice uh, dragging a document into a folder. So before the class period, I added a document and a file folder to each desktop. Um, they worked, I had them work in pairs. Uh, they had lots of practice dragging the document into and out of the folder. Uh, this also gave them practice using double click to open the folder. And as you can see, we use laptops, so I didn't have any mice. So they got lots of practice learning how to use two different kinds of touchpads, uh, which, which again, that lesson took longer just because of that problem. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I used a lot of the handouts from North Star, and I, and this is one of them. Um, the reason I really like this is that I could do the lesson with the students, and the next class period, or two class periods later, I could show this to them and have them. Um, so I, it was like review, but also I could see if they really understood what we had gone over. So. Again, it's all made out for you. You don't have to do any of this. Uh, next slide, please. So last week, um, I got an email and said the new online learning was ready to be previewed. And I'm going, oh, OK. So I previewed it. And wow, that's all. Uh, wow. I'm so excited for this to come out in February. I'm, I'm sure I'm hoping a lot of you have already been able to look at this as well. It's really going to be a nice addition to what we're already doing in the classrooms. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, the big thing is, did you, you know, what happened with results? Well, we started, you know, second week in September. The second week of December, I thought five of my students were ready to take the test. I had them take the test as a practice test. And then when they finished, I printed out what they still needed to learn and work on. One of the five passed in that practice test. Four were like in the 70 to 83% range. So we talked about what they needed to work on and, and, and uh, worked on that the next week. Uh, and then I gave them the proctor test. Out of that, three of them passed. Um, and they've received their certificates. So, of course, that really excited all of the other students. Um, the other students are still improving. Some of them need more hands-on practice. But we'll keep working until they all pass. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that's all I have. I've got my email here in case anybody has any questions uh, after the fact. And then also just a link to the North Star Digital Literacy Assessment. Um, were there any questions?
Elizabeth, or is there any questions or? Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, Jen okay. Jen added a link to a um, document that has more on vocabulary oh. literacy. So. Oh, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, and I guess, Pam, I was kind of wondering, did you find that you were having to um, take things out of the rest of your curriculum to make time for this? Um, or was it actually um, helping you, you know, if you're doing something in Google Drive anyway, um, did this actually save you time? Yeah, actually, um, before, yeah, actually, we didn't... Uh, I didn't have to take anything out of the curriculum. I I just kind of condensed things. So, uh, you know, 15 minutes isn't much time out of a two and a half hour class. So it really worked out very well. I was astonished. I thought I'd have to, I, I didn't know what I'd be losing by doing this, but they are very happy to have the correct vocabulary. Yeah, that's, that's really encouraging to hear. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that is one of the biggest barriers is finding just finding the time to add more stuff to what we're already doing. Oh, I see that um, somebody has a question about North Star for digital learning hours, and I don't know that. Does anybody else? I believe I've heard that the the online platform for students um, will be able to track their time, so we will be able to use it for distance learning hours. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, very exciting if you use distance learning in your program. Um, and then I see that, Lucy, your hand is raised. If you want to unmute yourself, then you can ask your question. Maybe. Oh, no worries at all. Okay. All right. Oh, and then well, Jane had a question. Um, as some students pass the basic skills test, are you going to move the class on to some of the other modules or keep with the basic skills? Um, no, I've got to keep them challenged too. So I'm that's why I'm kind of looking forward to those online modules because I could have them doing that while we're working on the other basic skills with the rest of the group. Sure. Well, we'll have more time for discussions and um, questions later on. So I guess we will move on. Thank you so much, Pam. Um, so since we um, are missing our other panelists, you get to hear more from me. <laughs> um, I teach in the Dakota GED program, which is uh, part of American Indian OIC in Minneapolis. Um, although we have GED in our name, it's really an ABE program. I mean, we teach um, pretty much NRS level two on up. Um, a good mix of native English speakers and um, higher level ELL students. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, Google Suite for the most part. Um, and when I say Google Suite, I'm just talking about the free um, apps and tools that are available to everyone. I'm not um, talking about Google Classroom or any of the business applications that you have to pay for. Um, so just things like Gmail, um, Google Drive, Docs, Sheets, Slides, Google Calendar. Um, I think there are so many advantages to using this um, in your classroom and getting your students um, used to these tools. Uh, they're accessible anywhere from any device where you have internet access. Um, they're very common. You um, are probably already using some of them. And I found that my from a lot of my students, they they come and they show me their cell phone and they're like, is this the same thing that's already on my phone? And yes, it is. It's um, preloaded on a lot of mobile devices. Um, for the most part, it's totally free. 
Um, one really, really wonderful feature is that your work saves automatically. And there are just an infinite number of things you can do with these tools. Um, I'll only be touching the tip of the iceberg today, um, but a quick search online will bring you to tons and tons and tons of resources. Um, there are some possible cons. Um, learners have to be able to remember their login information for their Google accounts across um, multiple devices. So um, a lot of the time I'll encounter students who have their email on their phone, um, but then have long ago forgotten their password and are not able to log in on a computer, which um, is really necessary for typing and a lot of um, the higher level things that I want them to be doing. Um, so that's an issue, but again, an important life skill that we need to be teaching our students. Um, Google Apps are not universal. Um, there are alternatives available from Microsoft and other competitors. Um, so one reason you might not want to use it is if your organization uses one of the alternatives. Um, although I would argue that um, you know, there is no one universal system that everybody is doing and you have to start somewhere. So you might as well start with what's freely available. Um, and a lot of the skills will be transferable to other platforms. Um, and the third um, major downside that I see to using it is um, that concern about security and privacy and how much do you want to let Google into your life and how much of your information do you want to hand over to Google? Um, and I think that's an important conversation to have with students at some point. Um, very few of us probably are aware of the extent that so much of our personal information is being shared with Google and other huge corporations. Um, but I kind of see it as, you know, it's just the price of doing business and, <laughs> Um, you know, just kind of part of being a digital citizen today. So um, I have totally drunk the Google Kool-Aid and <laughs> use their um, tools all the time. So um, when new students enroll in our program, they get a um, orientation welcome packet. And it includes this computer and technology checklist. Um, and I, we have them all create a Gmail email account if they don't already have one. Um, they use their Gmail account to um, send a, just a practice email message to all of the staff members so that you know, we know you know how to send an email. Um, if you're going to be gone or something, you can contact us. Um, and then I, students don't always do that, but I, I included on the checklist, you know, they need to sign out of their Gmail um, because, you know, they're using the classroom computers and for the security and privacy issues. Um, we also, uh, so it is a one room schoolhouse environment, but we've started having um, math and reading classes um, just an hour um, for each subject, four days a week. Um, and then the rest of our time is like uh, tutoring and um, independent study lab time. Um, but I've started putting all of our class materials in Google Drive and I'll show you more um, of that uh, shortly. Um, it's, it's really, really uh, helpful for my classes. <laughs> um, Another thing you can do if you don't necessarily want to make your um, materials, um, sorry, um, you can make things, if you don't want to put it in Google Drive where it's private and students have to log in, you can um, 
make um, any document uh, public to everyone on the internet. So anyone has the, who has the link can access it. So for our students who are using um, Edmentum for distance learning, I have an orientation assignment where they need to watch some videos and answer some questions. And I put the links to the videos um, in this Google Doc. Um, and then I used a link shortener, Bitly, um, to make the URL a little bit more manageable for them to type in. Um, and then they can just, um, they get their worksheet. If they haven't set up their um, Google account yet, it doesn't matter. They can just go to this website and access this document and access the videos. Um, and then of course, when you do wanna keep things um, private to just your students or just your uh, program, um, you can, put everything in a Google Drive folder and then just share the entire folder. So um, I like to give um, view only access to the students and then um, I give the my fellow staff members um, editing permissions. So um, you can just see here, this is um, just what we've done so far in math this month. We've got our class slides and then all of the handouts and um, projects we've been working on this week um, and also answer keys um, to some of the things. So if students are gone, they can um, just go to Google Drive. Um, I actually put it in our math class um, expectations that um, the first thing you do if you miss a class is that you need to go to Google Drive and um, look at the slides and try to figure out what you missed. Um, and then of course, if you're still unsure or if you need help, then you can ask someone. Um, but the first step is um, going to Google Drive. That's just the expectation for everyone that we're, we're going to use this, this tool. Um, another really, really nice feature of Google Tools is that it's very, it makes collaboration between students um, and between you and the students uh, really, really easy. So the last um, few major writing assignments that I've done in my reading class, I put on the uh, revising and editing checklist that the last step is to collaborate with your classmates, read your classmates um, writing and make comments. Um, and you can kind of see an example of some comments that students gave here. Um, I've done it both in Google Slides and in Google Docs. Um, this was a Google Slides or like PowerPoint presentation. So each student just had their own slide to type their writing on. And that seemed to work really well for a short piece of writing. Um, for longer pieces of writing, I've done something similar, but I just gave each student a page and inserted a page break in a Google Doc. So everybody um, has access to this one, either like a Microsoft Word document or like a PowerPoint presentation and they type their own things and then um, can see and comment on others. Um, okay, see Pam has a question. Do I put all of my math lessons on Google Slides? Um, Yes, I'm kind of addicted to it. Um, well, I mean, as an ESL teacher, um, we know that visuals are so important. So that's just the easiest way for me to include pictures um, in my classes is to use Google Slides and project them um, with our projector. So, and I, you know, I'll put the, the objective for the day and the agenda um, in the slide presentation and then any activities that we're doing. So, um, yeah, I it's it's just an integral part of what I do every day. <laughs> um, and then Nicole has a question. Um, have I run into any privacy issues um, with sharing with other students using their personal Gmail account? Um, not yet. I've only been doing this since July. Um, but I guess um, I, I, th I can think of one student who had a Gmail account that he didn't want to use for school, so he just created a new one that he would use for school. And the nobody has said anything to me so far about um, 
not wanting to share their email address. So I think um, I think we're okay so far. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Nicole? Okay, great, thanks. Um, oh, and then one other way that I use Google tools um, is to help with volunteer coordination. Um, when I first started at the organization, my um, kind of my main role was the volunteer coordination aspect of it. And then um, now I'm a teacher, so I have many roles, but um, the I used to just have a calendar in Microsoft Outlook. And so the volunteers would email me or call me and tell me when they were going to come in and I would update the calendar and print it every week and it was just a lot of work and then I went on maternity leave and decided I've got to have some other way to manage this so I created um, a Google Calendar and it's not public to um, the entire internet it's I just share it with our staff and volunteers um, and since the volunteers have access, they can just go in themselves and add or edit their tutoring times and they take care of it and it's really wonderful. <laughs> um, so this is just an example of what next week it's going to look like um, for our volunteers and teachers. Um, if there aren't any more questions about Google tools right now, I'll move on to formative assessment. Um, I guess Google Forms is still a Google tool. <laughs> um, and I'm going to give you a chance to actually try out these first two um, assessment methods, and then we'll talk about the third one. Oh, I see Mariah has a question. Do I have volunteers who have struggled with adapting to the Google Calendar method? Uh, yes. Um, so I have to teach digital literacy skills to my volunteers as well as my students. Um, but I mean, I, I, you know, I help them and I still go in and update the calendar myself sometimes. It's not really a big deal, but for the most part, they're able to do it themselves. And um, it just, I find it really helpful to for my sanity. <laughs> so, um, back to um, formative assessment. There are, of course, we know many wonderful ways to do formative assessment um, that do not involve technology. Um, but uh, personally for myself, I feel like I'm often just drowning in stacks of little half sheets of paper and sticky notes and index cards. And I'm not always the greatest at going through them promptly and then giving them back to students so that they can actually get feedback, which we know is one of the main purposes of formative assessment. Um, so using some of these tech tools um, helps me give feedback to students um, much more rapidly. And it also um, helps me organize the results um, a little more efficiently. So I'm going to give you a chance to actually try out uh, a quick little quiz. Um, go ahead and take out your phone or other mobile device if you would like, or open another tab in your computer browser and go to this um, website, bit.ly slash 3612D, um, and there's just a little quick two-question quiz, um, and then you can, um, after you've submitted it, you can click on that view score button to see your score. So I'll give you a minute to try that out, um, and then I'll show you on my end what the results um, look like. There's the link again, sorry about that.
Oh, Lucy, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I guess you'll just have to watch and maybe this is something you can use in another context sometime. She says, um, Google Docs are blocked in corrections. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, I saw that a few of you, oh wow, 21 responses already. Okay, so um, this is what the quiz looks like when you create it. Um, it's nice, or sorry, when I go over to the questions, this is what it looks like when you create it. Um, one nice feature is that you can embed um, photos and also videos um, into your quizzes if you wanna ask a question about um, a visual stimulus. Um, you can do lots of different types of questions. So I just did multiple choice, but you have um, check boxes and uh, open-ended responses and all sorts of things. Um, and then you get, if you click on this responses tab up here, you can see um, all sorts of, you can see the summary, which is everybody's um, like average points um, and then I have to hide the chat here so I can see only five people got the first question correct and only two people got the second question correct but that's fine um, and then yeah since it's Google they're all about the data so they give you all these graphs um, and then you can also see individual responses so I didn't um, require you to put your names in it um, this time, but that is an option, which obviously you would probably wanna do most of the time for students. Um, so you can go through one by one and see each person's individual results. Um, so this is response number one, and you can just click through and see everybody's. Um, yet another option is if you click on this uh, green icon here, it gives you a spreadsheet. Um, so you can see um, all of your data in a spreadsheet if that is useful to you. Um, let's go back to the slides here. Um, another thing, you don't have to necessarily use Google Forms for a quiz. Um, it can be really nice to just use it for open-ended responses. Um, so for a piece of writing a couple months ago, I um, asked students when they were done typing it and they were done collaborating and had gone through all the revising and editing things on my checklist, um, they had to fill out this Google form and answer a couple of questions, including uh, what do you think are the strengths of this piece of writing and um, what, specific things would you like um, me or the other teacher to provide you um, with some feedback on. Um, and I just found that really helpful to make my um, grading a little more manageable and also to just work in some of that metacognitive reflection on your work, um, which we know is valuable for our students. Um, any questions so far? Okay, um, so the next um, tool that I've sometimes used for um, assessments is called Socrative. Um, and it's, there is a paid version, but I've never used it. Um, the free version works great for what I need. Um, this is, um, I show this slide to my students um, whenever we use it because I have to remind students to use um, our Wi-Fi in the building. So I give them the Wi-Fi information and we talk a little bit about, you know, what does your internet browser icon look like on your phone? Um, and we make sure everyone can access the Wi-Fi. I mean, some students don't need to if they have, depending on their data plan, but 
most students will tell me, oh, I don't have any data. I didn't like, you know, had some issue paying my bill or something. And that's okay, because you can just, you can still use your phone um, with our Wi-Fi and it works just fine. Um, so we're gonna try out this one as well. Um, so go ahead um, again on your phone or in another tab of your browser, you're gonna go to Socrative.com. Um, choose to log in as a student and then enter the room name Dakota GED and practice taking the quiz. All right, so let's take a look at some of our results. Um, so I will hide your names for now. Um, so you, I, what I usually do is I'll actually project this on the screen with the students' names hidden, um, and that allows us to, um, you know, see as a class what um, we're doing well and what we're struggling with. Um, so, yep, so several people are still working and um, several people have finished. Um, you also have the option in Socrative to, um, when you launch the quiz, make it so that um, students can only advance one question at a time. Um, so I've done it, I've done it this way and I've also done it um, where I control the pacing. Um, and both ways have their uses, I think. Um, sometimes it's nice to go more slowly, um, just one question at a time, and you can be sure that everyone is actually answering um, and then discuss um, correct and incorrect answers. Um, So I think, um, well, just uh, what questions do you have about this tool? Yes, Camilla has a question. How do you set up a room for students to join? Um, when you, um, if you just go to Socrative.com and create um, a teacher account, uh, I, part of that process is deciding on a room name. Um, and then uh, students just 
um, that, that's what students will always type in. Um, actually, yeah, so my, my room name is Dakota GED. It might be possible to have more than one room, but um, I'm not sure why you would really need to do that uh, because unless you wanted to have multiple quizzes going simultaneously. Yeah, no problem. Yes, um, Patty's asking, does this work with Androids? Um, in my experience, it works with um, all types of devices because it's just uh, web-based. So there's no app to download. Um, students just go to the website through their internet browser. No, students do not need an account. Um, just like you um, all just did just now, you just <laughs> go to the website, um, log in, enter the room name, and um, it's right there. It's, it's pretty slick. Um, Pam is asking, is it easy to use for a teacher? I feel like it's um, easy. I mean, um, I learned about it in just a quick 45 minute session at Summer Institute with Susan Wettenkamp Brandt. And I went right back and used it in my classroom and then the next like week or two after Summer Institute, <laughs> um, I thought it was uh, really fun. Yeah, I mean, like any new device, you wanna play around with it. Um, and kind of figure it out for yourself first, but, um, but yeah, I, I really like it. Um, also like, um, similar to Google Forms, you can upload uh, pictures when you're creating your questions and you, um, so we had some short answer um, and multiple choice, and um, there are there's also like a poll option um, when you go to launch something. Um, you can just do like a quick question, they call it, um, where it doesn't necessarily give you a report um, at the end. But for most, um, for quizzes, you can actually get uh, reports that you can download um, with all this you know, student responses. So that can be useful. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so, um, so Google Forms and uh, Socrative, um, obviously students have to have their own devices to um, use that. Um, in my class, I just have students use their phones for Socrative um, because almost all of them have a phone. And whenever, in the few cases where I've had a student who didn't have their own phone, um, I'll just pair them up with another student who does have a phone and they can do it collaboratively. Um, or if there's a volunteer in the room, um, the volunteer is usually willing to share their phone so the student can use that device. Um, we don't have Chromebooks or um, tablets or anything like that in our room, and it's kind of unwieldy to have people log into the classroom computers. So that's what I've done. Um, but you, um, you know, you it's it's flexible. It works on a variety of devices, both Socrative and Google Forms. Um, you might be in an instance where um, you don't really have access to hardly any student devices, um, in which case um, Plickers is a nice alternative. Um, the only person who has to have a device to use this is the teacher. Um, and you download an app 
onto your phone or your tablet. Um, and then you print out from their website this, um, you can sort of see it in the picture, um, set of cards. Each card has a weird random shape on it. And um, each side of the shape has um, a very small A, B, C, or D on it. So you create a quiz um, that I think, I think unfortunately for clickers, you're limited to just multiple choice questions. Um, but you create your quiz and then project it on, on whatever board you're using. And to answer, students will hold up their piece of paper um, with the, the letter that they chose facing up. Um, and the nice thing about it is all the cards are different. So um, a student can't just glance over to their neighbor and see if they're holding up letter A and then copy them. Um, they, the letters are small enough that um, they can't really copy each other. So um, you can set it up uh, a couple different ways you, where, so the first way would just be um, students get any old card and it's not, um, you're not really tracking individual progress. You can also set it up where every student is assigned a specific card and so you would give that card to that student every time um, and then it will generate reports um, for you so you can um, use it like an exit ticket to track people's progress a little more formally. Um, I have to admit, I have not actually used this with adults, um, but I, in my former life as an elementary teacher, um, it worked really well. And I, I think it would work well for adults too, if you were in a situation where you just didn't have enough devices to go around. Oh, Camila says she uses it at her school with adults and likes it. So, oh, good, that's good to hear. Oh yeah, using it in orientation. Um, that would be, yeah, that's a really good idea. We should think about doing that at my site. <laughs> um, especially like if you don't really need to track the responses, but you just wanna get an idea uh, in general, how are people understanding what you're telling them? Um, well, let's move on now to our idea swap. Um, Pam and I are not the only ones who have ideas about how to use technology. Um, and we really want to know how do you um, use technology to enhance teaching and learning in your setting. Um, I'm hoping we'll have a lot of good um, discussion right now. Um, and then I will compile a list of these and post them in Schoology later so you'll have access to them. Um, so go ahead and type in the chat box or use the raise your hand feature and Lindsay can unmute you. Okay, I see a hand. Is it Matira? Matira? You can unmute yourself. Yes, it's Matira. Matira. Um, I... I'm kind of going backwards a little bit here. I was going to... I'm referring to North Star, the curriculum. I tried it out for um, like kind of like an elective class because every student always says they want more computer knowledge. So we did it um, like before class for an hour. And I found that the people, I had such a difference in the knowledge that they had, you know, the one room schoolhouse theory where I had some people that couldn't understand anything and some that were bored out of their skull. And it ended up flopping that elective class did. I mean, I have no attendance now for it. And I just don't know how to keep the advanced students going when you're trying to teach the lower level, the, liter the digital literacy. As you know, We were doing um, computer basics, and I never even made it through it. And I just wondered if anybody had any ideas.
I think that's a great question. Um, I don't personally have any feedback to offer yet, but I'm just waiting for a little bit longer to see if someone does want to jump in. Um, Bill is asking, uh, Matera, do you have records of certificates? Because that might help to incentivize. No one completed it. Matera, do you want to repeat the question? Sure. I was just looking for any information that anyone has about how do I keep the more advanced technology, the more advanced digital literacy learners occupied while I work with the, the lower students that don't have the knowledge. I think that was what the problem was, is that our more advanced students got bored with the curriculum I was going over. And I tried to cut things out and tried to speed it up, but I just lost all students. So I see Astrid just um, posted a link to external resources um, related to North Star. Astrid, do you wanna say anything about that? Sure, I was just gonna jump in to give a little explanation. I'm wondering, uh, I'm not sure what the, the skill range of your students are, but I'm wondering if some of your more advanced students could do some more independent work with those external resources or um, as Pam chatted, the, the online curriculum um, more independently or working in pairs perhaps so that they can support each other while you offer more, um, handholding and support with the students who are just starting to develop their digital literacy skills. Um, it's like they, they didn't really engage with each other much. So it was very hard for me. I don't, we're, we're going to try something new though, because we feel that maybe more, maybe doing it more in class time instead of before or after class. And then we, a lot of people work overtime before the Christmas and so many people couldn't come because they were working extra hours or whatever be the case. But I just found it really hard to keep people going. They kind of just stopped and waited. Yeah. Have you ever, did you try at all having students work in pairs? I know some teachers have had success pairing students with one computer and at least two students so that they have to work together to complete tasks. Um, no, I never thought about that. And that's I know that's a found that to, to really boost people's um, engagement with each other. Um, Pam, you're chatting that you use pairs most of the time. I wonder if you want to chime in and talk about how you set that up in your classroom. Um, okay, if I'm, I think I'm live now. Um, my volunteers, I always have at least a couple volunteers uh, and uh, they would work with the students who really would need it. Um, sometimes I pair them high-low. Uh, I don't always do that because that can get to be a drag too for the higher students, but the volunteers really helped with the lower level students. They need that one-on-one -on -one and that extra help. Uh, does that help? I'll, I'll mute myself again. Thanks, Pam. Yeah, and I'm just thinking back to um, some things I heard at Summer Institute. I was able to attend that pre-session on the Google Applied um, Digital Skills curriculum. And um, this same idea was also echoed by Sarah Vanderwerf at our math institute. Um, this idea that you really need to teach people the mindset that 
you can just use Google or whatever search engine to search for the answer to something online. And if we give students that essential skill, it makes um, so many other things accessible. Um, so maybe that's, and I admit I don't really, I have not spent a lot of time on how to do an effective Google search in my classes, but maybe that's something we all need to think about. Like if we just teach them that one thing, um, it makes a lot of other things easier. Also, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, with the mixed level classes, um, one, um, the, the new North Star curriculum really like engages learners at so many levels. Um, but I also have found that uh, my students, no matter how old they are, um, love to create. And so even if I'm teaching double clicking or clicking and dragging or selecting, um, I'll have a kind of end, like, end goal for them, which is like, okay, pick your favorite poem or take an excerpt from this poem that I have and um, like create a slide and add pictures and change the background color, like highlight text, change the size, change the font. And that kind of stuff, um, the students who have more comfort with the computer um, really enjoy kind of, you know, making a masterpiece. Um, and the students who don't, they can just get through the basics of typing, you know, their name at the top of the page and making sure that they can, you know, start a new line or whatever. Um, so like doing something like creative that they can kind of take it as far as they want is one thing that helps, uh, helps has helped me with the faster students. And then the other thing, um, I, I have a colleague here in the room with me suggested uh, North Star also has a version of their test where you don't need to, the students oh, don't need to log in. Website. It's the public website. And so um, you can put the students on there and then there's no rec, like there's no formal record of their scores, but you can watch, they can kind of engage with it. They can work in partners and they can kind of have a lower stakes way to preview and experiment with the information. Um, and and then as a teacher. Yeah, and and that is all. I also use the public website uh, to project. I project the um, public website and have the students use it as a class activity. So each, as we go through each question, I'll have different students to answer the questions. And then we'll do a quick little uh, conversation about why that specific answer was correct or incorrect. That's our technology teacher. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, Pam has chatted, when I do Google searches, I give easy questions to the beginning level students and more difficult questions to the advanced students. So for instance, I will have students look for information on a holiday. Um, yeah, lots of opportunities for differentiating. <laughs> Bill, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, um, I found I just started using um, CommonLit as as a, a distance learning tool, and my students uh, mostly use phones for their for their distance learning. And what I really like about CommonLit is that it um, it allows for extended answers. And so the students have to write a bit and think a bit. But when it comes to typing with extended answers, then they have a real hard time because they lose track of what they're saying because they're focusing on their thumbs. Yeah, I definitely hear you on that one, Bill. Um, yeah, my students who come in and they already have Google Drive on their phone and they, you know, they can see all the stuff that I've uploaded, but then they want to 
type their essay on their phone and I, I try to tell them like that's probably not the most effective way to do it. You probably really want to get on a computer or something that has an actual keyboard. Um, yeah, I don't really, I don't know what the solution is necessarily if students only have access to phones. Anyone have any bright ideas for that? Oh, Camilla says perhaps accepting audio recorded responses. Yes, I'm sure that it brings its own host of issues, but gives your thumbs a break at least, <laughs> for sure. Um, Bill, are you able to post the URL for CommonLit? Is it just commonlit.org? Yes. Okay, commonlit. I'll just type it in for you. Thank you. And then I also want to call attention to uh, Teresa Fisher's comment about modeling using the new reading skills for today's stories, um, having students use them more independently when they're getting used to it and then outside of the class. Um, I totally understand I'm not modeling enough it enough first for asking them to use it independently, but just didn't want that to get lost in the mix either. Um, and also Camilla mentioned um, Padlet and uh, the website liveworksheets.com. Camilla, um, and I apologize, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly this whole time. Um, do you wanna say anything about um, either of those? Sure. Um, yeah, it's Camilla, but- um, Sorry. <laughs> you got it very close and that's fine. Um, Padlet is, free you create an account um, students don't need to have an account and it's um, it reminds me most of what you what you showed with google drive um, but you can create um, padlet it's it's kind of like a like an online bulletin board um, and so you can kind of collect links there um, but it's a little bit more visual like um, more like pinterest so you can have um, pictures of links um, or like icons to represent things. You can put up links to your Google Docs and worksheets. You can organize things by topic. Um, and depending on how you set up the permissions, students can comment on posts or interact with each other um, anonymously or, or using their name. And a couple of teachers at our school, um, at my school, like swear by it for uh, keeping track of what they do each week so that the students can look there first when, um, when they've been out or if they want um, like an extra YouTube video that explains something, 
they can look there. And so um, I can send, I can share a link to one of their boards um, just to see, but there's like a lot you can do with that um, if you want to like dive in and they have a lot of good training videos. Um, and then live worksheets, it's one um, that I guess would have a similar function as Google Forms. Um, but what I like about it is, so you, again, you create an account and you need to make accounts for your students, which is, uh, can be tedious, but um, you can upload PDF versions of worksheets and then add um, text boxes or like tagging different features so that it can basically whatever you could do on paper, um, whether it's matching, fill in the blank, responses, you can kind of digitize it so that it grades it and the students can do it online. Um, and it reduces just like paper use um, and sometimes putting things in Google Forms um, just takes takes longer just to think through how to how to show some some of the paper resources that I have uh, digitally. But then with live worksheets, I don't have to reformat anything. I can just throw it up there and then uh, kind of add the digital features. Um, and like I'm currently like in a battle with myself about whether I want to just commit to one um, or commit to the other. But they're both great. And um, Live Worksheets has a lot of stuff on there for like language instruction already. People can share their worksheets and it's just very refreshing. Um, and I, like I said, similar in function to like Google Forms. Um, I think my students are tired of using both and I don't know which one's best so, so far. I just use them both. <laughs> Thank you. That sounds really fascinating. I'll have to check that out. Um, and Bill also chatted that he uses a Genius Scan, um, which I assume is an app that you would download to your phone. Um, and it makes a PDF of student work. So um, instead of typing an extended response on your phone, I presume students could write it on paper and then just make a PDF of it and send it, um, which would also be really handy, I think. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your participation. Oh, Camila has one more um, idea. I want to use QR codes in my class because most students have smart devices, but I cannot figure out how to get all of their phones to register the code and open the link, especially Android phones. Is there an app? I um, personally used to have, um, I think it was just like whatever free um, QR code reader app came up in my search first on my phone. Um, but I'm not an Android user, so perhaps I'm not the best person for this question. <laughs> Well, I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. I see we're getting um, kind of close to 3.30. Um, so uh, by all means, keep sharing your wonderful ideas and questions if you have them. Um, Lindsay and I will definitely be sticking around um, for the next few minutes. Um, before we all sign out, um, just another reminder about the Schoology group. Um, there's the code and the URL for the article, again, if you need it. And then we have um, just some reminders about upcoming professional development opportunities. The spring regionals are coming up in March and April. Uh, there's another um, webinar uh, next week uh, related to ACEs and creating transparent assignments. Um, and then a CCRS support webinar at the end of January. Watch the um, 
Minnesota PD Connect newsletter for details and registration, please. And um, just another thank you, thank you, thank you again for all your participation and really good questions and ideas. Um, you will uh, get a webinar evaluation. Um, we really, really appreciate it if you can uh, fill that out. It's really pretty quick and simple. Um, Jennifer's asking, can I do the Schoology code? Yes, for sure. Here it is. Thank you, Sean. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you, Camila, for those Padlet links. Remember, this will all be posted in Schoology um, eventually, so you can look there for a nice, um, neat list. Oh, Carol, I see your message about the access code. Um, I will look into that and get back to you. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, Astrid says, make sure that you are trying to register for a group in Schoology and not a course. Um, Susan asks, where can I get the new North Star standards and the new North Star lessons? Um, I believe the standards are available on that digitalliteracyassessment.org um, website. Um, and then the lessons, um, you have to have a proctor account to access the curriculum. Um, Astrid, can you, who should she talk to if she doesn't have a Proctor account? There should be um, a link on that website. If you give me just a minute, I can pull it up as well um, okay. to request a Proctor account. Just a second here. Okay, I'm putting a web address in the in the chat link. My suggestion would be just to um, send a request to that email address. And I did confirm that is the correct code for the, the Schoology group, Carol. So just make sure that you are trying to log in to um, a, a group, not a course.
Oh, good. I'm glad you're already in there, Carol. 